All right, so this is our Advent series. We're talking about joy this morning. I loved uh, the, the reading that we did together. Um, this is, a, the, the Advent series is a series that we're calling uh, Signs of the Messiah, and we're going back to the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus walked along the road with a couple of disciples from, uh, on the road to Emmaus, and he said, be, and it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what he said in the, all the scriptures concerning himself. And so we're going back to some of those prophecies, prophecies that you and I are, are familiar with because, well, frankly, we've been through other Advent series before and we've heard these prophecies. But my question has always been, well, where do these prophecies come from? And so after a first, a rough kind of first week, I kind of felt like it was a little rough. Content was good. It was just my delivery was off. Um, so this, the second week, last week, oh man, I just started to really love this study. Loved what going to Gideon and seeing that the, the, the story of, of, of the defeat of the Midianites is in this prophecy of Jesus. And then, and then uh, this week, d- diving into the book of Micah and, and discovering that these, there's overlap. There's so much that's going on here. So many references to other things that are happening. And we get to dive into all of those things and look for the significance that maybe we've haven't seen in the past. And so uh, this week was really excited about, um, about this study. And so hopefully I won't mess it up too much uh, this morning in my delivery. And I hope that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will not only accomplish his promises, but will accomplish his speaking this morning and it'll bring us joy. So as we celebrate Advent, uh, two weeks ago, we declare that Jesus is our hope because God is with us. And if God is with us, there's a reason for hope, right? And then the second week, last week, we talked about how Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he alone brings this fullness, this wholeness of shalom, the shalom peace of God, which makes everything the way it should have been if sin hadn't entered into this world, just the way he created it in the beginning when he said it's good, that kind of shalom, wholeness, and fullness. And we're declaring that Jesus is the Prince of Peace who brings that. And this week, we're going to see that Jesus is where the joy is, okay? Uh, it's the ult- he is the ultimate joy found in an ultimate Savior. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that uh, in the book of Micah uh, this morning. Before we jump into that, what is joy? In this uh, Advent reading, Rachel read that joy um, is not synthetic happiness, nor is joy based on one's circumstances. Okay? So joy is this, is this happiness that, or this sense of satisfaction that, that endures despite our circumstances. And before I jump into the, to the passage today, um, I want to share with you a quote from C.S. Lewis. It's a quote that you are very familiar with. I mean, if you know any of C.S. Lewis's quotes, you know this one. And he says, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and with sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. You hear that? He says our joy is not, our our desires are not too strong. They're not strong enough. They're actually weak because we get distracted by these other things that we think bring us joy. Things like sex, things like drink, things things like ambition. And and C.S. Lewis is saying there is an infinite joy that's being offered to us. And then he gives us an illustration. He says we are like ignorant children who want to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are too easily pleased. Think about that. Think about that. When infinite joy is offered to us, and we spend our lives pursuing things that are like mud pies, sitting in a slum, and we're saying, this is, this is what I want. This is what makes me happy. And C.S. Lewis is saying, no, you've been offered a vacation by the sea. Something that is, is beyond what you can even imagine, what you even can dream of wanting, and that is infinite joy. Think about that. 
That's what we're going to press into this morning as we read from Micah. So let's go to Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, and then I'm going to give an overview of the book of Micah just really quick to, so we can see the context where this prophecy comes in. So Micah 5, starting in verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah from from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Again, another prophet talking about a child, right? Just like Isaiah. This is very awesome. And he says, Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Isn't that amazing? It's talking about Bethlehem. But who is this prophet Micah? Micah is uh, actually a contemporary of Isaiah. He is telling uh, the prophecies to uh, Judah at the same time that Isaiah is preaching. So, so as Isaiah is preaching about this child, Micah is also coming along and he's talking about a child. And he's saying, here's where the child's going to be born. Can you see how I'm getting excited about this? It's like it's just a continuation from last week. Isaiah has been sent to speak to the kings of Judah. And Micah is sent to speak to the common people of Judah. And so both of these guys, different guys, on the same page, prophesying about this coming child at about the same time. If we read uh, Micah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth, In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, remember Ahaz, we talked about him, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, and he he the word of the Lord is everything that he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So if you were to break down the book of Micah, you'd break it into three sections. And they they have these titles that that are kind of a little bit like, whoa, I want to read that. What's what's that about? The first um, section, if you broke this into sections, would be chapters 1 through 3, and they're called the Book of Doom. The Book of Doom. I mean, yeah, it kind of makes you want to read it, right? What's that about? And then the second book is called the Book of Visions. Oh, the Book of Visions. That's kind of, this sounds a little bit brighter, but still interesting. And then the last book is the Book of Judgment and Pardon. So let me just step you through. What, what is the book of doom about? Chapters 1 and 2 is, is, this, is this grief that Micah has over Samaria and over Jerusalem because war and exile are coming. And he's weeping, he's lamenting for his people. And there's judgment that's coming against wealthy oppressors. And it's coming against false prophets. And it's coming against uh, Israel's leaders. That's, that's why there's judgment that's coming. That's why there's war that's coming. Now, the, it's interesting that the section on false prophets, there, there is Isaiah and Micah, and they're preaching that war is coming, that, that the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to conquer Judah and they're going to take everybody away into exile. But the false prophets are saying, hey, don't listen to them. Don't listen to Micah. Don't listen to Isaiah. His peace is coming. His good times are coming. And so you've got these two voices in their culture, two very opposite voices, one saying war is coming, one saying peace is coming. And the people are stuck in the middle saying, who do we believe? Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like today? It does. Absolutely. Uh, the, the second book, uh, verses Four, or chapters 4 and 5 are the book of visions where, where um, first I, uh, Micah starts talking about the Lord's future reign. And it's very similar to Isaiah chapter 2. And Isaiah chapter 2, I just love that, that chapter. It talks about the mountain of God, Zion. And the, and the, the nations of the, of the earth 
are streaming to this mountain of God. And they say, let's go up and inquire of the Lord. It's, it's, it, you read these two, two passages, Micah 4, Isaiah 2, and it's, it's, it's almost like they're, they're writing, they're copying each other. It's really, really cool. And after that, he gives this prophecy of the ruler that comes from Bethlehem. He talks about Israel's return from exile and that this remnant will be purified. That's the book of visions. And in the last section, the book of judgment and pardon, chapters 6 and 7, that's where we get that famous verse that everybody knows from Micah, which is Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, oh man, right? You know that song? Brandon was going to sing it with me this morning. That's right. I hear it in the back. Right? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Does anybody, do you know the context of where that's coming from? The context of that verse that we take out of context all the time is a response to wicked people who want an easy fix. They say, what, what do we need to sacrifice? How do we need to make God happy? Do we just need to sing some more songs? What do we need to do? And in response to that, Micah says, you know what he wants. He wants you to do justice. He wants you to, do, to love mercy. He wants you to walk humbly with your God. All those other things he despises because your hearts are far from him. So return to the Lord. And at the end of of this book that starts with a book of doom are these beautiful words at the end of, of chapter 7. In fact, it surprises me as I read through it. I went, how, how can this be? How can he start where he started and get here? And in chapter 7, verse 18, he says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, talking about God. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot, and you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. So this book is a promise of God's steadfast love and faithfulness in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of exile, in the midst of judgment. God is still a God who has steadfast love and compassion on his people. So go and read Micah today. Seven chapters, you can do it this afternoon uh, and just read through and, and there's so much stuff in there. It is so good, uh, but just read it. Read it, I challenge you to do that. But let's, let's go specifically to this Micah 5.2. Um, prophecy about Bethlehem. What's so special about Bethlehem? Um, <clears throat> it says of Bethlehem that Bethlehem is too little to be among the clans of Judah. I guess that means it's too little to show up on the map or even to be considered as, as part of the kingdom of Judah. It's too small. It's too insignificant. It's a backwater forgotten town that no one visits unless they have to. Kind of, I was talking to Aaron uh, this week, and he reminded me of Luke Skywalker's quote from the first Star Wars movie, talking about Tatooine, saying that, well, if there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. And that's what Bethlehem was. It was not the bright, shining center of, of Israel. It was like, a, a what? What is that? I've never been there. Why would I ever go there? That's the kind of place it was. But let's, let's jump into the story of Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 2. So jump, <clears throat> jump into the New Testament. We'll see what Luke has to say about Bethlehem. And then we'll look at what Matthew has to say in Matthew chapter 2. So let's start in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first res registration when Quinarius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee. Remember, I showed you the map last week, and Galilee was up in the north. And Bethlehem was just tucked right underneath Jerusalem. So there's, 
you know, they're way up north. How did they get down south? Well, here's how, how it happened. They, there, was, there was a census, and he had to travel there. So, and Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, he actually went down, uh, to Judea, to the center of David, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger." because there was no place for them in the inn. All right, so that's the story of Jesus' birth, and he is born in Bethlehem. Let's look at Matthew, because Matthew's been kind of our guide all the way through this process. He's the one who's referring back to these prophecies, and we'll see in Matthew chapter 2 that he does the same thing right here. So Matthew chapter 2 says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so it kind of picks up right after Jesus is born, uh, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, hey, where's the king who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him and assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet the prophet Micah, who said, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. All right. Still haven't answered the question, what's so special about Bethlehem? All right? Well, Jesus was born there. Well, how do we know that this uh, Bethlehem, that's where the ruler is going to come from, that it's talking about Jesus. Well, let's go back into the Old Testament and just dig around in there. And I'm going to give you four different stories, four different places where Bethlehem comes up in the Old Testament. So when you hear the word Bethlehem in the future, I want you to think about these four stories that come from the Old Testament. All right. The first one is uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel, died and was buried near Bethlehem. And that's found in Genesis 35. Now, this story that I'm about to tell you kind of overlaps um, this Micah prophecy with another prophecy from Jeremiah 31. And so we're going to talk about those, those two things. It also intersects with this passage that I just read from Matthew chapter 2, where Herod hears from the, the Magi that there's a new king that's born. And what happens is that those magi kind of get an uneasy feeling around Herod and they sneak off to go worship uh, the king in Bethlehem. And it kind of makes Herod a little mad. And he's, he's filled with paranoia. He wants to, to make sure that this new king doesn't challenge his right to, to lead. So he sends soldiers and they kill all of the babies in the area of Bethlehem, two years and younger, to make sure he can eliminate this future king. But Jesus is spared because an angel comes to Joseph and Mary and says, hey, flee to Egypt. And they, they do. In Jeremiah 31, there is this prophecy about uh, Rachel, who is buried near Bethlehem. And it says, um, I, there was a voice heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Okay? And so we see that the fulfillment of this prophecy right here happens as Herod kills all these babies. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the, 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 a whole city? It, yes, it's small and insignificant, but this whole city being invaded by soldiers who come in and they find babies and they rip them out of their parents' arms and they kill them in front of them. Can you imagine the sorrow, the, the wailing and the lament that's coming from this place? And it says that Rachel, who's buried there, is weeping for her children who are no more. Now, where does that come from in Jeremiah 31? And who is Jeremiah? 
Jeremiah is this prophet who comes after Micah and after Isaiah, and he speaks uh, during the time of Hezekiah. He speaks uh, because he's telling the people, hey, turn back to the Lord, otherwise the Babylonians are going to come, and they're going to take you into exile. Now, wait, 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 wait. Isaiah was just saying that the Assyrians were going to come and that they were going to take you into exile. That seems to be a little inconsistent. Well, there's a story there that's missing. It's a story about Hezekiah. Hezekiah hears about the, the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are knocking at the door. They've sent down all these armies and armies, and he actually repents before the Lord. And the Lord delivers Judah. It delivers Jerusalem. And, and the, the Assyrian army is defeated, and they're called off to war somewhere else. And they get defeated by the Babylonians. But then Hezekiah does something stupid and he invites uh, the Babylonians to come and check out my palace, look at all my riches, look at all the stuff that I have, and they're taking notes. Don't, don't pay attention to anything we're writing here. Invade Israel later, lots of good stuff, right? And that's what they do as they come back. But, Isaiah, but Jeremiah is preaching and he's prophesying to these people. And he's saying, turn back, turn back to the Lord. Otherwise, the Babylonians, Babylonians are going to come and you're, they're going to take you off into exile. And that's what happens. Now, Jeremiah 31 is this prophecy of joy. And it surprised me. I was like, what am I reading here? I thought I was reading about, about Rachel weeping for her children who are no more. But I'm reading along and in Jeremiah 31, 13, it says, Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance what is this? And the young men and the old men shall be merry. Sounds like Christmas time. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them. I will give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, like the presence of God for the priests. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. So why is there, it just seems like this prophecy is out of place. And in the middle of this prophecy of joy, of this return from exile, of this remnant being able to come back home, and they're dancing and they're feasting, in the midst of that, he says that there's this voice in Rama weeping, loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She's refusing to be comforted because they're no more, because they're in exile. And she's still there alone, and she's waiting for them to come home. And they're coming home with, with joy. And they're coming home with feasting and dancing. Isn't that awesome? It's an awesome prophecy. And at the very end of that, even better than that, is the promise of the new covenant. And God says, not only am I going to bring you home, I am going to give you a new heart. And I'm going to write my word on your hearts so that you won't stray. Isn't that beautiful? That is the story of Jeremiah 31. So what do we know about Bethlehem? Bethlehem is a place known for sorrow and death, but there is a promise of joy there as well, okay? So when you think about Bethlehem, I want you to think about Rachel. I want you to think about the return from exile, the sorrow that's there, and the promise of joy. Here's the second story. The second story is that the story of Ruth is actually uh, based in Bethlehem. This is the place where the kinsman redeemer saves Ruth and Naomi in their poverty, par, par, poverty and dis, despair. I can't talk. <laughs> and in Ruth, uh, Ruth chapter 1, uh, Naomi says to the women of Bethlehem, as they've, they've been in a foreign land and they've lost their husbands, they're, they, they're destitute, they're returning home to hopefully find some kind of, make some kind of live, living. And, the, and she says, Naomi says to the women, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. For God Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. That's what Naomi says. And you know the story of Ruth, right? Ruth comes back. She doesn't leave Naomi. They come back, and Ruth starts working in the field of Boaz, and Boaz just happens to be a relative. And Boaz steps in and marries Ruth, 
and, and Ruth has a son. So now uh, God has blessed Ruth and blessed Naomi through their kinsman redeemer. And at the end of Ruth, the women of Bethlehem say to, 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 to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you to this day without a redeemer. <laughs> May his name be renowned in all of Israel. You hear that? When you think about Bethlehem, I want you to think about the story of Ruth and how not just Naomi, but all of us are not left this day without a redeemer because Jesus came to Bethlehem. Um, this is a place known for redemption and it's known for restoration of joy. Okay, so not only is it a place of sorrow and death, but there's a promise of joy. Uh, Bethlehem is a place known for redemption and restoration of joy. And the third story is about David. So David actually, um, there's, he grew up in Bethlehem. And in one of his, uh, one of his journeys, as, as he's, um, he's kind of roaming around in the deserts, he was in a cave uh, near Adullam, and he's, he's thinking, oh man, it's been out here in this cave, and I'm so thirsty. The water around here is dirty, uh, and I would just love to have a drink of water from the well that's in Bethlehem. Oh, it's so cool. It's so good. And three of his mighty men, sitting, probably sitting by the fire, he, over here, David, and this is in 2 Samuel 23, and they said, you know what? Hey, Bethlehem's like overrun by Philistines. But I bet the three of us could go down there, fight our way in. One of us gets some water for the king, and then we fight our way back out. Who's in? And they go, oh, yeah, we're in. And so these three mighty men go in and they do that. They fight their way into Bethlehem, defeating the Philistines to get a cup of water to bring it back to David. And when they get back to David, they offer him the cup of water, and he says, far be it from me. David says this. O oh Lord, that I should do this, that I should drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives. And so he takes the cup of water and he pours it out as an offering to the Lord. So this story is a story that tells us that Bethlehem is a place where a sacrificial gift was given. David's three mighty men gave him this gift, risking their lives. But it's also a place where an offering was poured out to the Lord. Mm, that sounds significant, doesn't it? Let's talk about the fourth story. Bethlehem is significant in the Old Testament because it is the birthplace of David, and it is where he was anointed king by Samuel in 1 Samuel 16. In fact, in 1 Samuel 17, it says, Now David was the son of an Ephrath Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse who had eight sons. It's interesting when you look at Luke chapter 2, and it says, For unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is born, who is Christ the Lord. The city of David, I always thought it was Jerusalem, right? Because that's where he reigned. But the city of David is actually Bethlehem. Pretty cool. And then in Isaiah 11, Isaiah prophesies that out of a shoot is going to come out of the stump of Jesse. Where Jesse was from, there's going to be a shoot. There's going to be a branch that's going to come up. It's going to bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord is going to be upon that branch, talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. I, I never really experienced until I moved to the North Pacific Northwest that, that there are trees around here that are coming out of stumps. Okay, I remember going on my first hike in the woods with my friend Eric, and I'm like, what in the world is happening right here? And there's this big old massive stump of a tree that used to be there, and it's been cut down, and in the center of it is this sapling that's growing out. And then I'm looking around, and I'm seeing even bigger trees coming out of the stumps of other trees. And I'm like, he's like, yeah, yeah, that's just, that's just what happens around here. Stuff grows. And I'm like, oh, okay. I've never seen that before in my life. But when, when, when I read this, that the this shoot is going to come up from the stump of Jesse. That's what I think of. That's what I think of. Where Jesse was, this mighty, mighty tree. From that place, a new, a new tree is going to come out, and that tree 
is the Messiah. So despite the failure of David's children, despite Israel's sin, despite judgment, despite exile, God's promises are still true and faithful. And this, Bethlehem, is a place where God's promise to David is going to come. An ultimate king is going to arrive with an everlasting kingdom. And this is why Bethlehem is special. This is what I want you to think. I want you to think about these four stories when, when you think about Bethlehem and go, it has meaning. It matters that he was born here and it speaks to us from the Old Testament. So, joy, right? How does this bring us joy? Because I, I want to have joy, right? I want you guys to have joy today. How does this happen? How does it happen? Um, the, the name Bethlehem in the Hebrew is Beit Lechem. Um, it also could be Beit Lechem uh, with an A instead of an E at the end. And the reason why is in the Hebrew, in the old, old Hebrew, they didn't have the vowel marks. It's called the uh, unpointed text. And I have gotten to read from an unpointed text before and was thoroughly confused because there's no vowels in there. So this could be Beit Lehem, which means house of bread, the name of Bethlehem, house of bread. Or it could be Beit Lehem, which is house of flesh. Now, why is this significant? Even the name Bethlehem, Beit Lehem, why is it significant? Well, let's jump to John chapter 6, verse 32, and see if this, these words from Jesus match up to this place, the house of bread. In John 6, 32, Jesus said to them, to the crowds, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The house of bread. Then they said to him, the crowd said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life from the house of bread. And what do the crowds do? They begin murmuring and complaining, right? Jesus just referenced Moses and the children of Israel wandering in the desert, and they, this crowd behaves just like them, to murmur and complain when the bread of heaven's been given to them, when manna from heaven is given to them. And we continue in, in verse 50. Jesus says, This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh. Beit Lechem, the house of flesh. This is beautiful. My flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. And what did the, the crowds do? They did what they did before. They continued to murmur. Who is this guy? What, what, what is he talking about? How can, he, how can he say these things? And then in verse 56, Jesus says, he who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood, and we're going to do that remembrance ceremony together in communion. The person who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. And he said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, which remember last week, Capernaum is in Galilee where the light is shining in the darkness. He's, he's declaring to them the good news of why he came and that they can have life in him. This is how joy is experienced. When we realize that Jesus is the bread from heaven that gives life. He was born in the house of bread, the house of flesh. We experience joy by receiving him and being nourished with the life that he brings. That's where infinite joy comes from. That's what C.S. Lewis was telling us about. This infinite joy that we've been given 
Can we even imagine it? And this is why it's so great. This is why your joy in Christ is so great, is that joy has come for you, and it's come for me. Jesus came to Bethlehem. He came to this small backwater town. He came to humble places and to humble people who would receive him, not to the rich, not to the powerful, not to the influential, not to the people who deserved it, not to the beautiful or the famous. Bethlehem reminds us that joy is ours because he came to a place where joy was promised, where redemption was seen where a sacrificial gift was given and where a gift was poured out to the Lord. Joy came to a place where a king after David would establish his kingdom forever and it would be a kingdom of peace. This is joy that Jesus came for you. Joy is that Jesus came for me. So the question is, is, is will we receive this humble king? because he's where the joy is. I keep saying that. He is where the joy is. And when you uh, study the Bible with me next year, um, this Bible recap podcast, they say that at the end of every podcast, because he's where the joy is. As we read the word together, we're going to find that Jesus and God is where our joy is. It's not in these other things. It's not in these other things that are going to distract us, these cheap imitations of joy that don't last. And our circumstances, crazy circumstances, the crazy world that we live in, just dashes them to pieces. I want joy that lasts. I want joy that's real. I want my joy just, just on this foundation of truth that Jesus has come and I can find joy in him. It's something that we have to fight for every day. Distractions are real. Temptation is real. But I'm going to fight for it. And I hope that today um, the word of God reminds us to be a people of joy. If he's calling you today to to faith in him, um, man, I'd love to have that discussion with you. I'd love to talk about how Jesus can be your joy, how he can bring forgiveness into your life, how there's redemption, there's purpose, there's meaning in Jesus. So if afterwards you want to talk with me, if you want to send me an email, people who are on Zoom, you can send me an email. We can talk about how Jesus can be your joy forever. Um, I want to end today with a little uh, Christmas ornament that I stole out of the foyer. Um, It is actually the, the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And the last verse says, O holy child of Bethlehem, Descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us. Abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. Isn't that beautiful? That's what, that's what the gospel is. That's what the gospel is for us today uh, out of this song that I've been singing since I was a little kid, and you probably have been too. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, that today you can be our joy. Thank you today that, Lord, you can, uh, the story of, of, of Bethlehem, this prophecy of Bethlehem, of this ruler who's coming, and he is, he is, uh, he's a promise of joy. He is a promise of this Father who has, has compassion upon us still, who has, has been has filled with, with faithfulness. And we can experience that. God, I pray that we do. I pray that we walk in that. I pray that you become our joy, and even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of our sin, because there's forgiveness in you. God and Lord Jesus, we ask you to give us joy. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, amen. All right, all right. <clears throat> so let's, uh, what did you hear today? Um, what, uh, what did the Lord say? Or what did you hear that you thought, hey, I've never heard that before. That was interesting. Or what question do you have? Um, let's see. I have a microphone up here. And I believe it's on. 
And uh, Danny, you want to help me with this? You're sitting in the back, which makes it a little bit... Okay, you're lim- going to limp up here. You're not that old. Here we go. Thank you. Clayman wants to say something. There we go. So I've been thinking since... I remember you saying that about the flesh and, and the cry of the Christ. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and when I when you think of like flesh, you think of like it's disgusting. But when from God, it's pure. Like it's it's like it's like the a very delicious fruit. It's that's very. It's like a very precious rock or mm-hmm. stone, like a diamond, but more precious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And when we we take communion together, that's that's the thought uh, as we as we hold those those uh, symbols in our hand that this is so precious that what we've been given that God gave His body for us and He gave His blood for us and they're not gross things but for us they're they're pictures of life. That's really good, claim. And thank you for sharing that. I just am encouraged every time I hear about the prophecies that look forward to Jesus. I forget how many there are. And when they come through, it's just like, man, God is laying this incredible path throughout all of history that it's building to this moment. And when we are reminded of those things, I think it just encourages me a lot that Mm -hmm. this is not something that like God sort of fit into like how things were happening. He was building to this. This is a plan. So that's just encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. And I love it because I'm kind of a puzzle guy, like around Christmas time. Like we always have a puzzle out and I love putting it together and seeing how it fits together. And as I go through the scriptures and I'm like Jeremiah 31, you know, it's, it's like these puzzle pieces are fitting together. And I'm like, how this book is amazing. These guys are, I don't know if these guys knew each other, but it seems like they powwowed together to write this thing together, but they didn't. It's like all these different writers, all these different books spanning this course of time and it all comes together to tell this one singular story it is an amazing book there's no other book like it in the whole world who else somebody oh danny that's me yeah hey <clears throat> you know we speak of the uh, uh the rest uh, of that we have in christ and the joy we have from the finished work he did how do we fight the tension of what James tells us to count all joy when we go through all these trials. Mm. That's, that is good, because in the midst of trials, it's hard to find joy, isn't it? But, um, but James says uh, himself in that passage, he says, because we know that, that God is using these things in our lives to bring endurance, to, to make us mature in him. So he has a purpose behind it. Our, our suffering is not purposeless, purpose. I can't talk today. It is not without purpose, right? There's a reason. And and we don't have to look at God and go, why are you doing this? Why why are you being so this arbitrary and and just, no, he's got it. He's got, there's a reason for it being there. And we can believe in the God who brings us salvation is also working in us, even through difficulty for his good. The the verse in, 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 uh, in Romans, you know, that all things work together for good. And I got to get you that, uh, that quote from Spurgeon last week. Because uh, um, that's, it, it says it in there as well. So as we look around, you know, and it feels like there's so much turmoil and stuff, that that's the reality for the believer. Um, that, that God is working all things around us for good. That's just, man, that can be hard though still. Is there somebody on Zoom back there? Um, yeah, there is some people on Zoom, so uh, if you can unmute them at the soundboard, uh, and then um, Aaron, if you can unmute there. Yeah, uh, Aaron is going to um, come in first. And okay, say Aaron, so. Aaron, talk to us. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. great. Uh, I just love the whole bread of life piece. The reminding us that um, we are uh, sort of the... Um, not satisfied in anything else. And there's that special bread that gives life for us. And that's just awesome. It's, it's a good reminder. We forget so often. There's so many things that bring small joys, but, um, but only Jesus is the bread of life that brings real joy and mm-hmm. lasting peace. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is, and it's cool that Bethlehem means Beit Lehem. It, it means house of bread. That's just that when I, when I read that, I was just like, what? <laughs> you got to be kidding me because that is so cool. And I'm sure it's, it's gluten-free bread um, because gluten is bad, right? So who else? Man, it's cool that we can hear people on, on Zoom and, uh, and you guys can actually speak in the room. We can hear you uh, this morning which is a, is a cool new, new feature that we have. Anyone else back there? No? Okay, that was just Aaron. Well, thanks for, for sharing that with us, Aaron. Um, good, good. All right, thank you, Danny. All right, well, let's, uh, let's continue on in some worship, and then we'll have communion together. We'll experience uh, remembering the Lord and his sacrifice uh, through the bread and through the, through the, uh, through the wine or the juice. And um, yeah, it's going to be awesome, awesome to do that together this morning.